The file you are about to hear has been thoroughly scrutinized by the Ethics Committee and approved by the O5 Council for release to trusted associates of the Foundation. This is SCP Unredacted. The ticket lady's mouth widens and her eyes dart about. No soul has boarded a flight in 50 years. The aircraft sentinels upon the concrete plane, staring rapturously with blank squarish eyes at the terminal windows. Arranged on the runway, they resemble toys haphazardly spread on the floor. Those toys filled a young child's imagination, inspiring crashes and saves, left forever on dusty flooring amid stuffed animals and preserved crumbs. Those crumbs eternally stained that boy's tiny blue room, reconstituted fragment by falling fragment. One of those crumbs may have fallen into an air vent launched upward, eventually to land upon the planes at the airport. So diluted now, the wings resemble cellophane. Providing the lady her materials, she wishes me a safe and comfortable flight though she appears troubled by my additional questioning. She nods at whether she stayed all her life here and shakes her head at a proposal for company, but stares blankly and shuffles in place when asked her birthday or favorite color. Not the first simulacrum encountered here, but this one conjures particular sympathy. A desperate mind seems trapped inside. The plane's interior looks pristine, more than natural reconstruction. The seats have no wear or impact marks, and the windows appear spotless. Beyond mindless actions, the plane healed itself. A scented tree ornament left in my adjacent seat serves as omen for this congruence with nature. The plane slowly rumbles without voice or warning, only presumably the pilot shares the ticket lady's attributes, perhaps not so tortured. Fellow planes continue pain stares, rejecting the burden of watching their brethren take off for one penultimate time, their fellow pilot assigned one penultimate mission. Attempts at gaining info on other planes' innards led to more blank stares. It combines frustration with melancholy. As the plane ascends, I notice the safety manual on the back of the seat ahead. It identifies the plane. A Boeing 737 MAX. The line notoriously featured troubled maneuvering characteristics augmentation systems meant to mimic the previous Boeing line's flight behavior. Instead, a flight crashed into the Java Sea, leaving behind only life jackets and cell phones. Those cell phones collected and varyingly salvaged, revealed stressed phone calls, text messages, internet searches for proper crash procedure. Anything possible to spare not only oblivion, but the devastation inflicted upon their loved ones. The tin too plummeted besides, several hundred Indonesian residents and two foreigners strapped and bounded toward watery doom. Leaked messages from Boeing derided the airline for requesting further flight training in response to the crash, the vitriolic comments spawning no soft response, including threat of cancellation for several billion dollars worth of planes. The manual on the back of the seat insists, conversely, to maintain a clear head in case of aircraft failure. A similar pioneering and fog-headed spirit brought 87 prosperity-seeking individuals to depravity and madness. The band departed Missouri towards California, immediately preceding the infamous gold rush, though the path to promised fortune still remained packed before and after. A proposed shortcut only worsened matters, conspiring to detriment the group in all aspects. The author who suggested that shortcut later headed parts of the American Confederate Army and attempted to establish a Confederate colony in Sao Paulo before his death by yellow fever. 
the stuck wagon party, bounded by November snow, now receives memorial via a lake in State Park. Though an incandescent transcendentalist performance in 2134 largely turned the lake to a solid blue metal. One may presume any debris of the party remain encased in that metal deluge, frozen. Frost covers the passenger window, obscuring the view outside. Even with this, however, the outline of the bridge rises higher than any plane or shuttle could reach. The indiscernible contents bloom and wilt as if fast-forwarded, and I notice the wing has turned yellowish-brown. The wind blew off the the fierce wind extending to the entire aircraft and cabin. The chair in front slumps into a small mold, and the manual disintegrates in my hands. The combined velocity and wind speed at this altitude creates this phenomenon, though I may not call it unique. Beside the school, a pond froze over in winter, the first snowdrops briskly touching the glassy water surface, and children skated on ice. My friend, filled with a fiery disposition and athletic knack, sought the pond immediately and began running across the ice. He spun and twirled midair, attempted to mimic some moves he saw in Saturday morning cartoons, and paid no mind to the cracks. The first crack, a tiny figment, spiraled two more lines, and two lines from each of those, and so on, in a circle pattern. The phenomenon whisked around my friend until he stopped in the middle of the lake, noticing the pattern surrounding him. One step. At first, his instincts told him to stay still, and thus he sunk to the bottom some ten feet deep. The ice covered sunlight leaving his origin hole the only spot where pale beams could fade upon his face. The machines that covered him conspired to bring him upward, creating a coral-esque platform that extended through the ice. As soon as it started formation, it shrunk once more, the thing falling off my friend's body and drifting into the water. As my friend grew colder and colder from the heat dying off him, he gazed up and saw how far down he'd sunk. Those systems meant to protect him caused electrical shocks to delay any physical attempts to salvation, and my friend sunk further. He thrashed on the bottom, grasping the mud and dirt, until even those stressed movements began to shrivel. One movement, and he seized, left coiled. As oxygen depleted from his mind, his pupils spun round his eyes, the only movement left present on this body. The pattern of the eyes contorted, and his pupils formed the shape of an His body remained frigid. When I departed the plane, I noticed it had reconstructed itself. The plane was white. The inside was pristine. Thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, join my Discord community, hire me on Fiverr, or help support me by becoming a patron for as little as $3 a month. Regardless of tier, all patrons get early access to every single episode. The links are in the description. I don't have the talent it takes to write a skip. All I do is read. Original authors make this podcast possible, so credit to the original author. Their link's in the description. Show them some love as well. Consider becoming a member of the SCP Wiki, upvote their work, and maybe write a skip of your own. Maybe I'll read it here someday. You never know if you never try. The content of this podcast and content relating to the SCP Foundation, including the SCP Foundation logo, is licensed under Creative Commons ShareLite 3.0, and all concepts originate from scpwiki.com and its authors. This recording being derived from this content is hereby also released under Creative Commons Sharealike 3.0.